Colonel Orr joined the Royal Canadian Navy in September 1963 and graduated in 1967 from the Royal Military College of Canada. He was selected for air crew duties and completed five operational tours on the Sea King helicopter. Colonel Orr attended the Canadian Forces Command and Staff College and has held a variety of command and staff appointments in Canada, NATO, and the Middle East. He retired from the Canadian Armed Forces in September 2000, and since then has volunteered as a researcher at the Shearwater Aviation Museum, where he has concentrated his efforts on documenting the history of the Canadian Sea King helicopter, as well as the history of the air station at Shearwater, Nova Scotia. Colonel Orr, I think there's a book there. I'm hoping you will be considering that on the basis of what we've seen in the preliminaries. I should mention before I hand it over to Colonel Orr that uh, Sarah Hollett is, <clears throat> excuse me, filling in for Shirley Tillotson this evening. So Sarah will be fielding the questions and the discussion period that follows Colonel Orr's very interesting presentation to come. Seven Flags Over Shearwater. Over to you, Colonel Orr. Well, thanks very much, Lois. And I can assure you that the book has already been written. So uh, I'm off the hook for that. Thanks for inviting me this evening. And I'm looking forward to telling you something about Shearwater and its place in the aviation history of Nova Scotia and Canada. Before I launch off, I should say that the topic of Shearwater has been surprisingly well covered in a number of official and unofficial histories, along with several personal memoirs. While these are all important, I must acknowledge the major contribution made to the historiography of Shearwater by Colonel retired Ernie Cable, the Shearwater Aviation Museum historian, through his various articles in the Shearwater Aviation Museum Foundation's magazine, The Warrior. Please note that I will use the generic term Shearwater to refer to a location which has had many names, Baker Point, United States Naval Air Station Halifax, Canadian Airboard Air Station Dartmouth, Royal Canadian Air Force Station Dartmouth, Royal Canadian Naval Air Section Dartmouth, Royal Canadian Naval Air Station Dartmouth, or HMCS Shearwater, take your pick, Canadian Forces Base Shearwater, and finally, 12-wing Shearwater. Rather than give you a bookkeeper's account of squadrons, what types of aircraft they flew, and so on, I'll relate the Shearwater saga by using the various flags and ensigns that have flown over the air station and link those to some of the key players in Shearwater's history. My thesis is that Shearwater, in its various incarnations, is in many ways a unique institution and its history illustrates the many twists and turns of Canadian military aviation. Now, I, I think that I hear some virtual scoffing at the term unique. Isn't Shearwater just a collection of air types who at best clutter up Her Majesty's Canadian ships and at worst make a nuisance of themselves when they're ashore? Well, that's certainly one view. But I would counter by pointing out that from the very beginning, Shearwater has woven itself into the warp and woof of the nation. What other Canadian air station can claim to have been the subject of sketches by Arthur Lismer, one of the founding members of the Group of Seven? And what other air station <clears throat> appears in a classic of Canadian literature as Shearwater does in Barometer Rising? And finally, what other Canadian air station has conducted combat operations in both the First and the Second World Wars. As I mentioned previously, my presentation takes a great man approach to the topic, and Shearwater has had its share of great men, and great women for that matter. The great men include Brigadier General Lise Bourgon, who was the first woman to be appointed an operational uh, appointed to command an operational RCAF wing, that is 12-wing Shearwater, and who later commanded the Canadian Joint Task Force Iraq 
in 2015. But this evening, we'll talk about those who fit more closely into the framework described by Admiral Bull Halsey, the most pugnacious of the US Navy's carrier admirals in the Pacific campaign of the Second World War. Halsey stated that there are no great men. There are only great challenges, which ordinary men like you and me are forced by circumstances to meet. And trust me, Shearwater has had its share of great cha challenges. I need not remind this audience that there's a significant drawback to the great man approach to history, since it fails to acknowledge the major contribution of others, in this case, the ground crew, without whom none of this would have happened. With this limitation in mind, let's put some meat on the bones. A requirement to establish an air station in air stations in Nova Scotia was first proposed in 1917 as a result of the arrival of two long range German submarines in neutral American ports in mid to late 1916. The U-Deutschland seen here was an unarmed merchant submarine which visited Baltimore on the 9th of July, 1916 and New London on the 1st of November, 1916. U-Deutschland carried dye stuffs and chemicals to the United States and loaded strategic materials, including most embarrassingly, Canadian nickel for the return voyage to Germany. The second submarine, U-53, a combat submarine, arrived at Newport, Rhode Island on the 7th of October, 1916 for a visit of several hours a call that had great propaganda value as the captain opened the ship as the captain opened the ship to visitors from the US naval station on her departure from Newport just to make sure that the british and canadian uh, authorities got the message u53 sank four merchantmen and one passenger vessel in the vicinity of the nantucket lightship it was recognized that if german submarines ever reappeared in the western atlantic the fledgling Canadian Naval Services patrol force lacked the necessary offensive punch to counter them. Furthermore, the Royal Navy, contrary to their assurances at the outbreak of the war, was unable to offer any assistance and the United States Navy had yet to enter the war. The only available means of redressing the balance in the short term was to use aircraft. A proposal to develop a Canadian Naval Air Service was submitted to the Canadian cabinet in 1917, but unfortunately was rejected in the interests of economy. As part of that proposal, a survey of Halifax Harbor was undertaken to determine a suitable location for an air station and Baker Point between Dartmouth and Eastern Passage was tentatively chosen since it was served by both road and rail and had a protected anchorage for seaplanes and flying boats in the lee of McNabb's Island. A fictional account of the selection of the site in 1917 is described in some detail in Barometer Rising. Fortunately, no German submarines crossed the Atlantic in 1917, but in January 1918, the British Admiralty issued a warning that German submarines were likely to arrive in the Western Atlantic during the upcoming shipping season. Representatives of the Royal Navy, the United States Navy, and the Canadian Naval Service met in Washington in April 1918 to address this threat. And it was agreed that uh, air stations would be required at Halifax and Sydney, as well as Cape Sable, Nova Scotia, and Cape Race, Newfoundland. As a result of this agreement, the Royal Canadian Naval Air Service was formed by the Canadian government. But because Canada had neither the equipment nor the personnel to carry out aerial patrols in 1918, the US Navy agreed to fill the gap in Nova Scotia with their own equipment and personnel until the RCNAS could become operational in 1919. The American offer was not totally altruistic as more than a million American servicemen were on their way to Europe through Canadian as well as American ports and they needed protection. Baker Point was once again selected as a site for the air station in Halifax Harbor along with a site in North Sydney for the air station in Sydney Harbor. The proposed air stations for Cape Sable and Cape Race were not constructed. U.S. Navy personnel for U.S. Naval Air Station Halifax began arriving on the 5th of August, 1918, 
and establish a camp under canvas along with a temporary steel hangar still in use today by the fleet diving unit Atlantic. Lieutenant Commander Richard E. Byrd, who later achieved great fame as an aviator and polar explorer, arrived in mid-August to take command. As recorded in his autobiography, Byrd stated that with the hoisting of Old Glory at Baker Point at eight o'clock on the 19th of August, 1918, U.S. Naval Air Station Halifax went into commission as a war unit. On the 25th of August, a Sunday, one of Byrd's Curtis HS2L flying boats made its first test flight over Halifax to the consternation of the Halifax garrison, which in a tart letter to the Naval authorities on the following day, noted that they would appreciate advance notice of such flights since the fortress is equipped with anti-aircraft defenses. The American aircraft were ready for operations from Shearwater on the 26th of August and conducted aerial patrols until the armistice. The first two personalities I'd like to introduce are the aforementioned Lieutenant Commander Byrd on the left and Lieutenant Colonel John Cull on the right. Byrd, who had only received his designation as a Naval Aviator in May of 1918, was the offspring of a distinguished Virginia family with strong political connections. Even before he received his wings, he lobbied to be appointed to the US Navy's transatlantic flying team, his dream posting. Imagine his surprise when on the 12th of August, he received orders to proceed to Halifax. As he recorded in his autobiography, he initially thought that this was the greatest disappointment of my life. Perhaps the first, but certainly not the last person to feel that way about coming to Shearwater. Byrd carried out the operational duties of his command in an effective manner and devoted a great deal of effort to addressing the difficulties of long distance over water navigation. John Cole was a pre-war member of the Royal Navy who after commanding two submarines decided to join the Royal Naval Air Service just prior to the outbreak of hostilities. Loaned to Canada in 1918 to be the director of the Royal Canadian Naval Air Service at its headquarters in Ottawa, Cull had an admirable war record. While undoubtedly courageous in the face of the enemy, Cull was about to encounter another implacable foe in the shape of the Ottawa bureaucracy. The conflict mainly involved the inability of the Department of Public Works to construct permanent accommodations for American personnel in a timely manner. This struggle was only resolved through the personal intervention of the Prime Minister of Canada. Regrettably, time does not permit going into the deep, juicy details of this story, but suffice it to say that while Byrd's exploits in establishing an air station at Shearwater may be known by some, Cull's equally important contribution is virtually unknown. Cull and his small team in Ottawa were charged with nothing less than the establishment of a Canadian military flying service from scratch, including designing uniforms, such as those shown as the uniform shown here. And I love the cane. I can only imagine what kind of damage that could have done on a Friday night. More importantly, they had to engage in quasi-diplomatic negotiations with the US Navy in order to integrate American aircraft into an existing Canadian force structure. That so much was accomplished in such a short time was truly remarkable and was greatly aided by the fact that Cull and Byrd hit it off immediately and established a lifelong friendship. Following the armistice and pending a resolution of the government's policy regarding post-war aviation, the Royal Canadian Naval Air Service was disbanded and the future of Shearwater was literally up in the air, an uncomfortable but not unfamiliar predicament as will be seen. With the departure of American personnel, it was agreed that Canada would purchase all American ground equipment in return for the donation of 12 Curtis HS2L flying boats and 26 Liberty engines. This gift would lay the groundwork for an important part of the interwar period of Canadian aviation. In 1919, Shearwater was turned over to the Canadian Naval, Air, Naval Service and arrangements were made with the Samaris Forest Protective Association for the loan of two ex-USN Curtis HS2Ls to conduct forest fire patrols 
in the Shawinigan region of Quebec. Here we see one of those aircraft, A-1876, being launched at Shearwater. The pilot is Stuart Graham, a Canadian veteran of the Royal Naval Air Service and the first bush pilot in Canada. In the front cockpit is Graham's navigator, his wife, Madge. Of note, this very aircraft was recovered from a crash site in 1916 and following restoration is preserved in the Canada Aviation and Space Museum in Ottawa as La Vigilance in the colors of Laurentide Air Services. In addition to spotting for forest fires, the aircraft conducted aerial survey and photographic missions along with liaison duties. Thus, Shearwater can lay claim to having played an important role in the development of bush flying in Canada. In order to oversee the further development of both civil and military aviation, the government established the Air Board of Canada in June 1919, and Shearwater was eventually transferred from the Naval Service to the Air Board on the 1st of October, 1920. And so we have our next flag, or more properly, Ensign, that of the Air Board of Canada. In October, 1920, the Flying Operations Branch of the Canadian Air Board and the newly formed Canadian Air Force, a non-permanent, non-professional air militia subordinate to the Air Board, carried out the first Trans-Canada flight from Halifax to Vancouver. Once again, time does not permit us to delve into the story beyond recording that the flight began from Halifax on the 7th of October, 1920, and concluded in Vancouver on 17th of October after 49 hours and seven minutes of flying time. If this achievement fails to impress you, just imagine flying across Canada in open cockpit, war surplus aircraft in October. While the flight obviously did not set any speed records, it did achieve its intended purpose of bringing attention to the potential of aviation uh, to the general public and more importantly, to the Dominion government. From the mid 20s until the mid 30s, the activity rate at Shearwater fluctuated on a seasonal basis and the permanently assigned aircraft aug uh, were augmented as necessary from other air stations. Aerial missions included among others, aerial topography, experiments in crop dusting, forest fire patrols and customs enforcement. Following the election of the Mackenzie King government in late 1921, legislation creating a single Department of National Defense was approved in 1922 and came into effect on the 1st of January, 1923. The new department incorporated the former Departments of Militia and Defense, Naval Service of Canada, and the Air Board. Functions of the Air Board were transferred to a new Canadian Air Force structure, which was under the control of the Chief of the General Staff through a Director of the Canadian Air Force. At the end of December 1922, therefore, Shearwater was transferred to the Canadian Air Force from the Air Board and at that point wore the ensign of the Canadian Air Force shown here. This ensign was first flown at Canadian Air Force installations beginning on the 30th of November 1921, while Shearwater was still part of the Air Board. Of note, the ensign was at Air Marshal Sir Hugh Trenchard's insistence identical to the Royal Air Force ensign, despite internal displeasure voiced by some Canadian airmen. In January 1923, an application was made to King George V to confer the title of Royal to the Canadian Air Force, and this was granted on the 15th of February, 1923. This is not, however, recognized as the birthday of the RCAF. That had to wait until the promulgation of King's regulations and orders for the RCAF on the 1st of April, 1924. And on that date, the RCAF not only marked its birthday, but also adopted the dress and motto of the Royal Air Force. When the RCAF took over Shearwater, it continued to use the designation station until 1925. Then in order to give its organization a more military character, the term squadron was adopted and Shearwater became number four operations squadron. This was the first organized Canadian squadron to fly from the station and it continued to operate until 1926 
when the station became inactive and Shearwater was placed in a care and maintenance status. We see here a First World War Curtis HS2L flying boat from Shearwater, which was on a topographic survey mission in the Yarmouth area in the summer of 1925 and was diverted to attend a church picnic in West Pubnico at the request of the local member of parliament. My thanks to Laurent D'Entremont for the story and the photo. A further reorganization of the Department of National Defense in 1927 removed Shearwater from the RCAF structure and placed it under the direct control of the Deputy Minister of National Defense as part of the Civil Government Air Operations Directive. In 1932, because of a reduction, of a reduction in appropriations, this directorate ceased as a distinct entity and Shearwater was placed under the Senior Air Officer of the Royal Canadian Air Force, still responsible to the Chief of the General Staff. Also in 1932, seasonal preventive detachments were formed at Shearwater and other small air stations around the Maritimes to fly anti-submarine patrols, excuse me, anti-smuggling patrols for the RCMP. These apparently did little to stop smuggling and were eventually terminated after the 1936 flying season. They did, however, lead to the reopening of Shearwater on a permanent basis with the formation of number five flying boat squadron at Shearwater in 1934. Now enter Gus Edwards, our next personality. Edwards, a native of Cape Breton, joined the Royal Naval Air Service in 1915 through the Curtis Flying School in Toronto and eventually flew combat operations in France as well as Siberia at the end of the war. After repatriation to Canada, Edwards joined the Canadian Air Force in 1920 and following a variety of appointments was selected as the officer commanding number five squadron at Shearwater from September 34 until February 1938. While tasks initially were much as before, that is preventive patrols and photographic duties, the squadron and Edwards played a significant logistical support role in the Moose River mine disaster of 1936. But bigger plans were afoot. The threat of war was looming and military budgets slashed during the depths of the depression were slowly increased. At Shearwater, this translated into funding for an expansion of the facilities in the lower part of the air station through unemployment relief project number 153. On the the dilemma of rearmament. Determined not to repeat the catastrophe of the First World War, the King government decided that the RCAF was to become Canada's first line of defense and coastal operations were to be its primary role. Orders were placed with Vickers Canada in 1936 for the procurement of a modern flying boat, the Supermarine Stranraer. And number five squadron was one of the first uh, squadrons to be so equipped beginning in 1939. While Shearwater has been a sea, had been a seaplane and flying boat base since the First World War, it was now a too small to support aircraft for this task. So in late 1937, what is now the upper part of the base was acquired to provide runways, hangars, and further accommodations. This was the first concerted construction activity at Shearwater since 1918, and once again, it was done at the rush. And yes, in addition to bulldozers, those are oxen, oxen shown in the center of this photo. Although the facilities were not completed in time for the outbreak of war, they were ready for the arrival of number 11 Bomber Reconnaissance Squadron and their Lockheed Hudsons on the 3rd of November, 1939. Gus Edwards left Shearwater in early 1938, and during his time in command, he led the station through a remarkable transformation from operational backwater to being the only combat ready unit of the RCAF in Canada prior to the outbreak of the Second World War. As an indication of how seriously the threat of hostilities was taken, the first anti-submarine patrol by aircraft from Shearwater was undertaken in 
on the 22nd of April, 1939, in response to the reported sighting of a sub a Lockport area. The greatly increased presence of the RCAF in the local area was much in evidence during the royal visit of 1939, when King George VI and Queen Elizabeth visited Halifax. As part of the ceremonies, the Air Force mounted a guard and three strong rares from number five squadron flew overhead as an aerial escort for their majesties when they departed Halifax on board the Empress of Britain. In 1940, to reflect the growing Canadian sentiment in the RCAF, a maple leaf was added to the roundel of the RCAF ensign as shown here. During the Second World War, Shearwater became the main operational air station of Eastern Air Command, a vast home war establishment command headquartered in Halifax that eventually included the Maritime Provinces, the Dominion of Newfoundland, Labrador, and the eastern part of Quebec from the mouth of the Saguenay River north to Angava Bay. The facilities of the air station were greatly expanded as can be seen in this photo. In addition to supporting and operating several RCAF maritime and fighter squadrons, the station performed many ancillary functions, such as being the support base for the catapult launched hurricane fighters mounted on selected merchant ships, as well as the Royal Navy's fleet air arm swordfish aircraft assigned to escort carriers. Dartmouth was also the home port of the RCAF Marine Squadron, which had the responsibility to support coastal RCAF installations as far away as Labrador. And as legend would have it, the masters of, these, of some of these vessels were the very rum runners of the 1930s who have been the subject of preventive patrols flown on behalf of the RCMP. Rather uniquely, as the only suitable all-weather airfield in the area, both Maritime Airways and TransCanada Airlines operated from the station from 1941 until the opening of Halifax International Airport in 1960. Reflecting the major role of the air station, a civilian repair and overhaul facility of the Department of Munitions and Supply, Clark Roos Aircraft Limited, was established to provide depot level support to all the aircraft of Eastern Air Command. It was located in the vicinity of Eastern Passage where today's auto port is now located. After the war, this facility was purchased by Ferry Aviation Canada to provide similar support to both RCN and RCAF aircraft and would later be acquired by IMP Aerospace before they moved to the Halifax International Airport. The peak loading of Shearwater came in June of 45 when two squadrons of Lancaster bombers arrived to carry out training as part of Tiger Force in preparation for the final bombing attacks on Japan. However, before Tiger Force could deploy to the Pacific, the war, was, the war ended. It appeared that Shearwater would again descend into the morass of care and maintenance. However, in the closing years of the war, the RCN, in an attempt to secure a balanced fleet in peacetime, began the process of creating a naval air branch. When Royal Canadian Navy Air Squadrons arrived in, arrived in Halifax on board HMCS Warrior on the 25th of May, 1946. An RCN Air Section was already established as a larger unit at RCF Station Dartmouth. An agreement for dual control of the aircraft was worked out with the RCF controlling all shore-based activities, including support services, while the RCN controlled all embarked flying and operational flying from ashore. Over the next two years, the situation on the airfield evolved to the point where the RCN air section became the main user of the airfield. With dual control becoming a continuing point of friction, the Royal Canadian Navy looked for other locations in the Halifax area to establish their own air station, but it soon became apparent that there were no suitable alternatives. The issue of who should operate Shearwater was finally raised to the Cabinet Defence Committee and it was agreed that on the 1st of December, 1948, the RCN would take control of the air station and it became HMCS Shearwater and flew the white ensign of the Royal Canadian Navy. The first RCN captain of HMCS Shearwater, 
was Alexander Beaufort Fraser, Fraser Harris. He had been born in Halifax in 1916, but was educated in the United Kingdom where he joined the Royal Navy to serve as a pilot in the fleet air arm during the Second World War. Fraser Harris transferred to the Royal Canadian Navy at the end of the Second World War and was soon at Shearwater as part of the RCN Air Section. When he took over command of Shearwater, he was only 32 years old and reportedly the youngest peacetime naval captain in any Commonwealth Navy, albeit in an acting capacity. Fraser Harris was particularly critical of the RCEF for what he considered their slipshod custody of the air station. And in a classic entry in his report of proceedings for December of 1948, he wrote the following. To say that Fraser Harris was not a fan of the RCEF would not be overstating it. And his animus presumably reflected the prevailing attitudes towards the Royal Air Force in the wartime fleet air arm. Fraser Harris was captain of Shearwater for less than a year, but he set the pace for an amazing stretch of 20 years, running from 1948 to 1968. Looked at from today's perspective, the operational achievements were staggering. In that 20 year period, the RCN accepted three aircraft carriers, Warrior, whom we've already seen, Magnificent, shown here, and Bonaventure, shown here. In addition to the three aircraft carriers, carriers the RCN took on strength three types of fighters, Sea Fire, Sea Fury, and Banshee. Three types of fixed wing anti-submarine aircraft, the Firefly, Avenger, and Tracker. Two types of anti-submarine helicopters, the uh, Horse and the Sea King, and a variety of support and training aircraft. Added to that, there was constant construction activity as temporary wartime facilities were expanded and made permanent. Additionally, in the early 1960s, the RCN pioneered the marriage of a medium-sized helicopter with an escort-sized warship as shown here. These were heady days, but there were warning clouds on the horizon. The retirement of the Banshee jet fighter with no replacement effectively limited the carrier to ASW operations and dashed all hope for a balanced fleet. The RCN reached its apogee in the mid 60s and this famous photo shows the ships and aircraft of the Atlantic fleet during exercise springboard in 1966. Unification introduced in 1968 meant that naval aviators lost their ability to influence policy decisions and their interests were merged with those of the wider aviation interests of the Canadian Armed Forces. It also meant that Shearwater entered a new phase as Canadian forces based Shearwater and reported to Maritime Command, whose ensign is shown here. The final nail in the coffin of Canadian fixed wing naval aviation was the scrapping of Bonaventure in 1970. And with the last takeoff of a tracker from the carrier, a unique chapter in Shearwater's history closed. But as always, Shearwater persevered and entered a new phase as trackers conducted shore-based patrols, mainly in support of the Department of Fisheries. With the transfer of the trackers to Summerside, Shearwater shifted its focus to providing wings for the fleet through the continued operation of seeking helicopters. It's now time to introduce our next personality, Benny Oxholm. Oxholm joined the Royal Canadian Navy in the post-Second World War expansion and after training with the RCAF, he soon became a fighter pilot in the Navy, flying both Sea Furies and Banshees. He was appointed as base commander in 1974, a period of particular turmoil for Shearwater's both reduced budgets and the impact of unification came to the fore. Unification had introduced the concept of functional commands. And for both the Army and the Navy, this that meant that they could continue more or less as they had before. The RCAF, however, was broken into several different commands, Transport, Air Defense, Canadian Forces Europe for strike aircraft, Maritime Command for fixed and rotary wing maritime aircraft, Mobile Command for fixed and rotary wing tactical support aircraft, and Training Command. As Oxholm arrived, Lieutenant General Bill Carr and others 
We're needing a push to create a consolidated organization to administer all military aviation in Canada. While the doctrinal air aspects were important, on the coast, the issue quickly resolved itself into a debate over funding following the Trudeau government's imposition of severe financial cutbacks. In early 1975, Rear Admiral Boyle, the commander of Maritime Command, informed the Oxholm that he would be meeting in Quebec City with General Chouinard, the commander of Mobile Command, and General Carr to discuss the prospective makeup of what would become Air Command. Rear Admiral Boyle indicated that while he was prepared to reassign the former Maritime Air Command squadrons and bases at Comox, Greenwood, and Summerside to General Carr, he wanted Oxholm's personal recommendation regarding the future of the Sea Kings at Shearwater. Oxholm stated that in order to continue an embarked Sea King operations, he required an additional 400 personnel to correct the seashore ratio for the maintainers who had been on constant sea duty since unification. Additionally, there was a requirement to provide more funding for depot level support to the Sea King. Boyle replied that this was simply not possible in the current fiscal environment. Oxholm then advised that if the Admiral could not provide the necessary personnel and funding, General Carr could. To which the Admiral replied, then that's the way it will be. And so it was. Asked if he had second thoughts about joining Air Command, in Churchillian fashion, Oxholm replied, no regrets, never. And so on the 2nd of September, 1975, Shearwater came under the control of the new, newly established aircraft, excuse me, newly established Air Command, which adopted a Canadianized version of the wartime RCAF ensign. Roll on now to 1993 when Colonel John Cody entered the scene as CO of Shearwater. Cody had joined the Royal Canadian Navy through the Venture Scheme and spent his time at Shearwater in several squadrons flying the Sea King helicopter. He also served in staff appointments in Canada and the US. Just before he arrived, the Air Force went through yet another reorganization and Canadian Forces Base Shearwater became 12-wing Shearwater. Once in the chair, Cody was eagerly looking forward to the delivery of the EH-101 helicopter to replace the venerable seeking. Then in October, 1993, the newly elected prime minister, Jean Chrétien, took out his pen and wrote zero helicopter as he had promised to do during the election campaign. And the EH-101 contract was canceled. You can imagine the impact that this had on Shearwater and the armed forces. Cody remembers that when defense minister Colonet visit, visited the base, Shortly after the, call, uh, the cancellation, Colonet asked, can you keep the lid on your guys while we put the wheels back on this program? Cody assured him that he could, as long as the minister would promise that he'd go back to Ottawa and get another replacement program. Cody recalls that the minister smiled at him and said he would by the year 2000. Well, Cody kept this word and amazingly, the Sea King kept on flying until 2018. There is no need to comment further on the minister's promise. After this upset in February, 1994, a new federal budget brought even more bad news. Cody remembers hearing about base closures and Shearwater's name was mentioned. Later that night, the commander of the Air Force called him at home to tell him that Shearwater was in for a rough ride. It was not, however, left up to the, excuse me. It was, however, left up to the head of the Atlantic Canada Opportunities Agency in Halifax to call Cody later the next day with the specifics. As Cody has noted, it was ACOA that gave the definitive direction and not the military. Shearwater got on with the job of scaling operations back as directed. And as Cody observed, this was no doubt the single most harmful exercise I had ever been involved with in my life. Cody noted that the rest of the Air Force, particularly the go fast crowd, couldn't wrestle with the size of the reductions. The Air Force met all its quotas on the backs of the Sea King community during those first two years. We were then, as Shearwater still is, the place that just saluted and got on with things 
no matter how bad they seemed at the time. In close coordination with Bates Halifax, it was arranged that Shearwater will become a lodger unit of CFP Halifax and approximately 1200 people left the wing establishment in the course of six months. After all the uh, setbacks, Shearwater and the Sea King carried on in hopes of better days ahead. In 2011, the names of the former services were resurrected and what had been the Air Command Ensign became once again, the RCAF Ensign. We are now reaching the end of my talk. Not to leave you in suspense, in spite of all the challenges, Shearwater has continued to persevere and even prosper and the future is looking bright. The air station is now the main base for maritime helicopter operations of the RCAF and major construction activity has once again taken place, this time to welcome the new maritime helicopter, the Cyclone. Since its inception, Shearwater has served under a variety of organizations, hence the title of my talk. Its location at the entrance to Atlantic Canada's major port and on the great circle route between North America and Europe means that it has been and will continue to be involved with those that go down to the sea in ships. In conclusion, I'd like to offer this photo of Shearwater then, that is in 1919, and now a similar photograph uh, taken in 2016. Whether in peace or war, under whatever flag or ensign, Shearwater has made a major contribution to Canada, to the Halifax Dartmouth community and both civil and military aviation. I can do no better than to use John Cody's words about Shearwater when he reflected that, after all, I think the old girl is safe for many years to come. Thank you. And I'm now prepared to answer your questions. <laughs>